tonight, I'm really pleased to pr have our panel come up to the stage. If everyone could take their seats again. We will take a break after the panel. I'm going to introduce Mark Garber. Mark is um, actually on the board of the chamber. He is the president of the Pamplin Media Group, and I've had the pleasure to work with him for the last four years uh, as my, in my role at the chamber. Um, the Pamplin Media Group uh, publishes the Portland Tribune and 24 community newspapers, as well as our local outlook. Mark is on probably a gazillion boards, and I didn't want to list them all because that would take a long time, and probably he doesn't want to, me to tell everybody that, but um, yeah, as he said, he's on the Chamber Board, he's on the East Metro Economic Alliance Board, and the Mount Hood Community College Foundation. He's also served on the Leadership Council for the Metro Area's Community Investment Initiative, and I'm really pleased um, to have Mark here today, and I have to tell you, he did a personal favor for me to rework his schedule to do this, and he's going to be introducing our panel, so thank you very much, Mark. Thanks, Allison. You know, I was thinking about this topic this morning and, and um, wondering if our goal is to get young people to put away their video games and study their math and science, do we really think that legalizing marijuana is going to help in that regard? I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Just wondering. We have a, a great panel here, and um, so I'm going to introduce them, and then we're going to move into some questions. So we'll start with Mark Lewis. Mark, if you would let them know who you are. And uh, Mark is the STEM director for the state of Oregon. He's a lifelong educator and advocate for youth. Mark has a passion. Sorry about that. <laughs> he has a passion for the critical role that education plays in shaping the lives and prosperity of individuals and communities. He brings over 25 years of experience in STEM, from his first career as a satellite engineer to teaching high school science and mathematics to international community development in several countries overseas. He currently serves as director of STEM for Oregon's chief education officer in the Oregon Educational Investment Board. In that capacity, he facilitates the work of the STEM Investment Council to make strategic policy and investment recommendations that will increase motivation, participation, and preparation of youth and adults in STEM. So welcome, Mark. <laughs> Second panelist, Deborah Durr, and I think you know who she is. Dr. Durr began her community college career as an adult returning student at Clackamas Community College more than 30 years ago. And yes, she was a mere child when she started. <laughs> She has held various positions in community college education as professional support staff, faculty, and administrator. She has served as a senior administrator in the states of Oregon, Wisconsin, and Iowa before returning to Mount Hood Community College as the 10th president in its 48-year history. Dr. Durr has served in roles to include coordinator of disability services, counselor, instructor, dean, and vice president for student development and services. Uh, and she did that actually at Mount Hood before leaving Oregon. In 2008, she accepted the presidency of North Iowa Area Community College in Mason City, Iowa, and that's where she served until she returned here to Mount Hood. And uh, on a personal note, I just want to say Dr. Durr has been a breath of fresh air. She's college had several sort of difficult years before she got here, and she's really reconnected with the community and uh, recently celebrated a uh, $1 million donation from uh, Junkie and Linda Yoshida to the College Foundation. So um, thank you. Um, and uh, also, my daughter did her first year of college at Mount Hood. If I had known that she was going to be on the five-year program at OSU, I would have had her do two years at Mount Hood. <laughs> but I want to personally thank you for saving me $20,000. And I'm not going to donate it to the foundation. <laughs> So our third panelist is Samuel Breyer, superintendent of Centennial, Centennial School District. And uh, Sam Breyer is a superintendent. And prior to being named into that job, he spent four years in the Centennial, Centennial District as principal of Butler Creek Elementary School. In addition, he spent a year working on assessment and school improvement for the district. Before joining Centennial, he worked for the Gresham Barlow School District as an elementary school teacher and as a TOSA, which is a teacher on special assignment, focusing on school improvement. 
He has been an adjunct professor at Lewis and Clark College, a performance auditor for Oregon Secretary of State, a small business manager, and a plywood mill worker, and he also served in the U.S. Marine Corps. So let's welcome Superintendent Breyer. So I'm going to transition to this other mic here. You got the Let's start with a basic question, and that is, uh, what factors do you believe are contributing to the low post-secondary education rates in East Multnomah County? Dr. Gurr, we'll start with you. So did everybody hear, did everybody hear the question? I will repeat the question while Mark um, gets his headset on. What factors do we believe are contributing to post-secondary education attainment levels in East Multnomah County. And Andrew did um, a very wonderful job, although it is quite overwhelming when we think about what our needs are in post-secondary education um, and the reality of where we're at. As I returned to um, the Portland area and became president at Mount Hood Community College after leaving for 11 years, it became very evident that the district that I had worked in for 15 years has changed. And the greatest change that I saw was the growing poverty in our area. And as we look at, and I know Sam will talk about this as well, but as we look at the numbers of students in high school who receive uh, free and reduced lunches, and then we look at the numbers of those students who are applying for financial aid to come to um, community college or the university. What we see is this huge gap of individuals who are first generation students. They are students who have not had a parent um, go on to any type of post-secondary education. So there is not a culture of thinking about believing in or understanding the complexity of going on to post-secondary education. And that's a huge, huge concern for us. Yes, we do have a challenge with the numbers of students who are completing high school, but we have a bigger challenge in relationship to those that do graduate from high school moving on into post-secondary training. And that training may be an associate's degree, but it may be within the context of a career pathway. The other thing that we find um, at Mount Hood in relationship to our students is a very small percent, about 10% of our students, are students right out of high school. The majority of our students are students over the age of 25. So as Andrew presented information about 16 months, we actually are seeing a much longer time of individuals who have completed high school or haven't completed high school who are coming back to college. So that poverty piece absolutely cannot be ignored in relationship to what's happening in our region. It is impacting our high school graduation rates. It is impacting a culture of going to that next step. And that is a societal issue. I don't think it's something that I can solve that Sam can solve, that the state of Oregon can solve, it's something that we have to recognize as a community and be able to move forward through that. Okay, Mark, would you like to address it? Sure, I, I just want to say what she said. <laughs> 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 because I think that that, that that was really spot on. I think, uh, number one, um, I'm not going to speak to the demographics particularly of okay. East Multnomah County, but across the nation, we know that um, attainment, particularly in community colleges, uh, is, is really the number one factor is affordability. Uh, and, and poverty impacts that tremendously. So how are we helping our students really gain access and, and retain them within the system while they're leading very complex lives? They're trying to make ends meet. They're often um, either single parents or they've got working, uh, you know, they're, they're working students. Um, we have to ask ourselves, what are those supports that are in our system that 
are there to, to help students continue on their pathway to success. So that, that is one, is the affordability issues and, and what are supports necessary there. I think um, the other, having worked in, in many uh, communities uh, across the world in developing countries, I think that this idea of, of understanding the changing demographics and cultures within our community is absolutely critical. By and large, our formal education system makes some assumptions about our students. And those assumptions are not correct. We have to better understand the lives that our students are leading, and that goes for K-12 system as much as it does for our post-secondary system. And we need to reach out to those uh, communities and engage them with culturally responsive supports, better understand what are the messages that we are sending that actually set up um, this, this expectation of post-secondary uh, attainment, or are we not? Are we sending those messages that actually um, don't resonate with different cultures within our community? And so it, it seems like a world away for many of our students to even consider going to an institution uh, of, of higher education, whether that's a two-year or a four-year um, institution. And then finally, I think that we have to take a really hard look at the relevancy of the things that we're offering. Uh, not only do we have to make sure that our programs of study are reflective of our industry needs locally, that, that students are able to see that it's a genuine pathway for a job, for a career, and that the courses within there are relevant. And I'm speaking predominantly about mathematics, <coughs> actually, because math is the thing that keeps me up at night. I'm a former math educator in K-12, and I know um, I've met so many individuals in our society who are mathematically damaged and traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> and that's 80 to 90 percent of you in this room, <laughs> I would guess. And, and pull no punches, it is trauma. I've seen what happens. <laughs> and we teach math like it is something disconnected from reality. If you like to cook, imagine memorizing the recipes in a cookbook. That's what it feels like to students. You don't learn to cook. You learn all the recipes. And they get pretty complex pretty rapidly. And so they're really disconnected from reality. They're what I call decontextualized. We strip them of everything that's really interesting. So I would appeal to our education systems to reconnect what we're teaching to the reality of what they're going to need. It. And if we can't answer w the question, when am I ever going to need to use this, then that <laughs> should really bother us. So. Superintendent Breyer, your district's kind of right in the middle of, of you know the geographic area we've been talking about, straddling Portland and Gresham. What, what factors are you seeing within the district that are presenting these challenges? Sure, well they've been spoken to pretty well before, but mm -hmm. um, for Centennial I can say uh, we now have 75% of our students who come to us on free and reduced lunch, and that's higher at our elementary grades. Um, more than 85% at most of our elementary schools are on free and reduced lunch. So there is significant community poverty, and that really is an issue. Mm -hmm. um, over 50% of our students are students of color, and um, we know that those um, communities have been historically underserved and have had challenges with educational attainment rates. Uh, we also know that poverty and educational attainment are mutually reinforcing conditions, right, unless there's an outside disruption. And that's not inherent to the community or the people. Um, the families and students we serve are intelligent, capable, hardworking, um, but poverty is a hard cycle to break. And in order to break it, it takes a disruption. And we aren't going to discover oil fields under Gresham, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully there's no World War and GI Bill to suddenly jump um, uh, educational attainment rates. So that disruption has to be created by our community. And uh, that's one reason I'm really excited to be here talking about these things. Um, we do have many things that we're going on right now to try and disrupt that, but it takes a significant large effort. And I suspect that questions about the specifics of what we're doing are later. So I won't address that anymore. But um, there is a community issue and challenge that we need to overcome, as well as specific practices in our institutions of education that we need to work on. 
um, and my colleagues addressed those before. Well, since you mentioned it, sure. and getting into the specifics, sure. so how are you and your organization supporting education for well-paying jobs that align with industry needs? How does STEM and, and career and technical education fit into that? And, and what kinds of public-private partnerships can be formed around that? Sure. So um, it really is about partnership across all of our organizations and not having K-12 education be one thing, community college be something else, business being something else. And too often in um, dialogue and discourse, those things are put at odds or in competition with each other. And we'll never get anywhere if that's the case. And, and that's not the approach we're taking. Um, I could talk forever on this, but I won't. Um, but I do have three specific examples um, around some things that are happening. One is a countywide approach, uh, one is a, some regional partnerships, and then one I can talk specifically about something that's happening in Centennial School District. So countywide, there is an initiative um, through the All Hands Raise Cradle to Career, which is about putting um, educators, business partners, and institutions, higher ed institutions together in a room. Um, on the, uh, specifically the 11 to 14, 9 to 14, depending on how you talk about it, um, initiative, we actually have a new group that's up and running. Um, Dr. Durr sits on that as the Superintendent Schlockner for Gresham Barlow. And that's about really working to look at regionally what are we doing to make seamless transitions from high school into the workforce. In K-12, we are doing everything we can to raise that graduation rate you heard about, make sure that our students leave our schools ready um, to be productive members of society and successful in the workforce. And to really smooth that out, there are a lot of things we need to do. Um, and I know we can talk more about the specifics around that too, but that's a regional approach. Um, in East County specifically, two things that I've talked about before are some partner charter schools we have here, high schools, so that students in um, going into 11th grade have an opportunity. It's not just about graduating high school. They have an opportunity to explore some career pathways. Um, we know that in recent years, many of the career technical education, the traditional vocational education um, pieces that we think about um, drifted or went away in many of our schools. But here in East County, we've actually made a significant effort over the last 10 years to bring those things back in a way that's about partnerships and about making them more cost effective. And so we have a regional partnership for the Center for Advanced Learning, which sits here in Gresham. And students in our high school can attend high school halftime and get their credits there. And halftime, they're in these um, partner schools um, experiencing at Cal, it's in um, digital media, healthcare, or manufacturing engineering careers. And those <coughs> programs are developed with um, Mount Hood and with industry partners in mind. And then um, the Academy of Architecture, Construction, and Engineering, which is um, partnership among Park Rose, Reynolds, Gresham Barlow, and Centennial, that uh, gives students exposure to careers in the design build industry. So they can receive their high school diploma while also having experience with careers. And that's one of those barriers, is giving them an idea of the sense of possibility and allowing them to explore, explore some possible careers. And we do see students coming out of those programs right into those career fields. And then on uh, a scale, which I think I'll talk about more specifically later, but in Centennial, we have something called Pathways for Manufacturing, which is a partnership um, between Centennial School District and several large manufacturing companies and Impact Northwest that is allowing our students in high school to experience what it looks like to work on a job site at a large industry, um, Vigor Industrial, for example. And those students are starting, this is a new program, starting to come out of high school and go directly into internships and job training programs. So those are some specific examples of practices that are going on to um, link K-12 to actual workforce development. Thanks. Mark, mm -hmm. from a state perspective, um, you know, what, what types of things is the state doing to, to help with that? Uh, boy, there's, there's a lot that we're doing, but let mm -hmm. me set up a little bit of context here. As the director of STEM and CTE and regional initiative, so my job title has expanded since that uh, short bi biography was sent to you, mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of interplay. And, and when we look at uh, what's traditionally defined as STEM jobs, okay, so, um, I'll just leave it there. I won't define it for you for a minute because uh, for, for some very good reasons because everybody has some really uh, different perceptions about what we mean by STEM jobs. But let's just go with the traditional ones right now. STEM jobs are growing at two to three times the rate of non-STEM jobs. And they're expected to accelerate in the future. I would pose out there that in this rapidly changing society, 
technologically rich, complex society, every job becomes a STEM job, or at least a degree of STEM literacy is required to be successful in nearly every job that's out there now. It's changing. The job market is changing rapidly. We cannot possibly anticipate the jobs that are going to be available in the next 10 or 15 years. And anybody who tells you otherwise is an economist. So uh, <laughs> it's, you know, uh, yeah, a little crystal ball there. And um, so, so when I think about this and, and thinking about how we couple uh, the education system with economic development, with community development, with workforce needs, we need to tightly couple those. And we need to shift from this idea that it's a particular certificate or a particular set of content knowledge that is going to enable those workers to be successful in the future. Quite honestly, they have to be adaptive. They have to have the skill sets that are necessary to, to actually adapt to that changing job markets. And every single person that I talk to in industry about this recognizes that. Not everybody that I talk to in education recognizes that. And so how do we, I guess, bring these cultures together in a way that, that recognizes that we need to focus on skills more than content? And, and so the initiatives that are underway, uh, and Sam mentioned a couple, is, is, is how do we make that transition between our K-12 system and our post-secondary envir environment much smoother for our students and much more transparent so that they can earn some, some college credit in the K-12 system that actually we, sh we know is, is a great incentive, particularly for first-generation college goers, to understand that they already have a foot in the door, that they already have earned some credit and, and that they can use to actually attain those degrees. So I think that that's important and we're seeing that uh, in Eastern Promise Replication Grants that uh, a great uh, thing that's happening over in the Pendleton region that's now being spread uh, to communities across the uh, state. We see tremendous partnerships around regional STEM hubs uh, or regional STEM partnerships like the East Multnomah County STEM slash STEAM partnership over there, which is, is similar to these collective impact partnerships where we're bringing together K-12 early learning post-secondary education, economic development, workforce, community leaders, uh, to, to really think about how do we shift the opportunity for our students and how do we recognize and embrace the idea that education is the single most important thing that we can do as a community and it's a collective responsibility. It is not just the responsibility of those people who have teaching certificates or degrees. And when I, when I think about my own journey and when I ask people about their journeys and, and what educators touched your lives, what people touched your lives and, and inspired you in a particular direction, oftentimes uh, we'll mention one or two teachers that impacted us. We'll also mention our grandparents. We'll also mention uh, the, the church youth group. We'll also mention the boys and girls clubs. We will point to other people in our lives. And, and so we need to be thinking about this as an educational ecosystem. And those regional STEM hubs are, are really looking at that ecosystem much more broadly. So that's something that's, that's very, very exciting. And then finally, we have um, the STEM Investment Council that was established in this last legislative round to take a bigger look at uh, how we can change, make recommendations to the education system that actually shifts uh, how we think about and transform, uh, transform education. And that's chaired uh, by Jim Pyro, who is the CEO and President of Portland General Electric, who are tremendous partners here. But we're also getting uh, a tremendous uh, amount of input from our Boeings, from our Intels, from, from other people from uh, industry and business. Thank you. Dr. Durr, um, obviously the college is involved in a lot of partnerships, and I, I think um, Mark touched on some of the ones that, that um, mm -hmm that are happening here in East County as well. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what the college is doing with partnerships and also to advance um, uh, the STEM education? I think the most important factor is that the college cannot do what it does without 
um, the collaboration between our K-12 systems and business and industry. That is key in relationship to um, how to respond to this question. When, when the question is asked, what is the college doing, um, you know, I'll share with you some of those ideas. The reality is, is that we cannot do anything unless everybody's on the same page and everybody recognizes that we have a responsibility to do this. So as I look at this, um, we think about our um, interactions and our collaborations and partnerships very early on. Um, I can go and talk about what Mount Hood Head Start is doing in working with families and talking with families about the importance of working with their children to increase their child's reading level. And if a mom is reading to a child, if a, a father is reading to a child, that's one of the greatest factors in relationship to what's happening with that reading level of that child in the K-12 system. Mount Hood has a role that we play in relationship to that. The other thing, though, um, is that we look at um, students as our students and Sam's students are Mount Hood students, Jim's students are Mount Hood students, Linda's students are Mount Hood students, and that's incredibly important because many of the things that we're engaged in to begin to build that, that culture um, that supports going on to post-secondary education um, has to start early on. And so we have programs that we're engaged in um, like Gear Up. Gear Up is a federal program. Um, we work in the schools beginning in eighth grade. Um, we work with uh, teachers, counselors, and families to begin to have them understand what it really means to go to college. Yesterday, um, we had a kickoff event for what's called College Application Week. It's a national movement to get people who are underrepresented um, and who live in poverty to have those kids apply for college. Now, Mount Hood is involved in that, but it's not about applying to Mount Hood. Yes, we would like them to apply to Mount Hood, but that's not what it's about. It's about taking the mystery out of this. The same thing with financial aid. So programs like Gear Up, where we're going down into the schools, working with our school partners to begin to address that need is incredibly important. A little bit of mention about dual credit and providing opportunities for students in high school who are ready for college level coursework, whether that's in career and technical education or whether that's in what I call the general studies area, um, taking their writing, taking their math, you know, making that junior and senior year very valuable for students who are ready for that next step. Um, the superintendents in East Multnomah County um, are working together to increase those possibilities um, of students being able to have that college experience. Nationally, there is amazing research that shows if, if youth have an opportunity to experience high school or college level coursework when they're in high school, their chances of going on to college increase dramatically and they do better than those students who did not. So we have to focus on those dual credit opportunities as well. We're doing a lot of things to um, look at what we can do to engage students when they come to us to encourage that completion. I look at the numbers that um, Andrew shared and I have to think of it within the context, not necessarily of associate's degrees, but of credentials that are valued by employers. And Mount Hood, for many, many years, has met our populations where they're at. And we have developed career pathways. And that is something that, you know, in education now we talk a lot about career pathways. But the reality is that's something that the college has been involved in for many years. Um, we used to be called 2 plus 2. Um, now there are articulated agreements. But the reality is, again, looking at how we can meet an individual where they are, whether it's in high school, or as importantly, and for us as I look at the demographics, maybe more importantly, are those people who are working now, who are working in jobs where they cannot support their families, work, looking at those individuals who um, English is not their first language, 
but are hard-working, ready-to-work individuals. And then looking at those people who have been chronically unemployed. And we often don't like to talk about those people who are chronically unemployed, but they are very, very important too in our future workforce as we look at that pool of individuals. So what are we going to do? That pathway piece is so important. Creating ways in which people, particularly people who are in poverty, can get work, get a credential, be employed, and then have the opportunity to go on to the next step in their education and training. And we have many partners um, across East Multnomah County that have been working with us in those um, career programs. Mount Hood, and I'm very proud of this, is the first program in the state of Oregon to have what's called an IBEST program, taking individuals that have literacy concerns and are looking at um, job skills and blending those together, working with employers to give them real life experience. And what we're seeing is the placement rate of those individuals is very high. Now, what happens next is then the opportunity to come back for additional training, additional certification, additional degrees. And I, we don't have a representative from our four-year schools here, but what I can tell you is that they also understand the importance of pathways. And so looking at that next step, maybe a person starts in machine tool, they then move to an associate's degree, an Oregon Institute of Technology is recognizing that associate's degree, and that individual can move on to a baccalaureate of applied science, which goes back to some of the things Andrew talked about in relationship to how few of our population have baccalaureate degrees. So at Mount Hood, we're kind of right in the middle. We understand the importance of what's happening at K-12, we want to, and before, you know, pre-K-12, and what, and what we need to do to engage there. We understand what's happening in our, in our region, and we're integrating and working to engage those individuals to get them to work. We also, though, the can't, again, I cannot stress this enough, we cannot do this without employers. So employers telling us what they need. Employers defining for us clearly what skills they need in their entry-level employees. And so how we bring together um, through our career and technical education programs, advisory committees, listening to what the employer needs are, and then taking that information and being able to redesign, re-engineer, revamp our curriculum. And community colleges, by and large, um, can do that very quickly. And so if you're asked, this is a sales pitch, to participate on one of those career and technical advisory committees, that's incredibly important. The other um, piece I want to talk about, though, too, um, and we talked a little bit about STEM, and the reality of STEM is what's happening. I mean, what job right now does not include some component of technology? <coughs> If you are in healthcare, the technology is amazing. If you are in advanced manufacturing, the technology is amazing. If you are um, in any type of career field, I mean, I look at what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, I could not survive without technology. So this idea of STEM is really the concept of the future. Um, we train um, we've trained two, two sets of technologists that, that I like to talk about. One is those individuals that are looking on moving to um, receive a baccalaureate degree in engineering. But the reality is for every engineer that's hired, five engineering technologists are hired, and that's the middle 40. So we have to also understand from you all where those jobs are and how we can train. So the baccalaureate degree is important. It's important for advancement. I mean, for heaven's sakes, you look at the number of degrees I have, it's just ridiculous. But, you know, it helped me advance. That's true anywhere. So for us, it's being able to, to support individuals to move through those pathways, to work with employers, our four-year partners, um, Work Systems Inc., and bring all of that together so that we can hear what the skill needs are and be able to address those skill needs to move forward and move East Multnomah County forward. Thank you. you. You all mentioned the importance um, of involving more than just uh, 
the schools and colleges in this process. So we could start with Sam, but you have a, an audience here of, of business people, not all of whom are you know, going to directly engage with the college in terms of a specific program. So how can the business community help you in, in these efforts? And, and we could start with Sam. Sure. Uh, well, Dr. Durr just mentioned a real critical area um, in our CTE courses, which are our technical education courses. Um, and we have a lot of those pathways either directly at Centennial High School or at Cal or ACE, the partner schools I mentioned. And each of those programs requires that there's an industry panel that helps us develop that course. This is not something we create in isolation. Um, we're guessing what you need. We need industry partners to help advise us so that students are having a real experience that will benefit them and expose them to skills. So participation at that level is fantastic um, for our CTE courses. Um, of course, we're always looking for opportunities for our students to be out and engage with businesses in terms of internships, um, other opportunities to see what happens um, in your business on a daily basis. Every Centennial High School student ha is required to spend some time in an outside business having that experience because, again, it's not just about um, graduating high school, it's graduating high school and what comes next. Um, and then the third piece is it really is about a community-wide effort. It's the support. How do we engage to solve these problems together? Um, believe that K-12 is attacking these problems both at um, the educational level in terms of getting the student to the high school degree, but I believe strongly that this is about community and economic development and that requires all of us working together. Mark? I could go so many directions with this. Um, I, partnerships are critical. Uh, engaging with our industry partnerships on, on a, uh, with our industry members um, in a variety of ways is critical to transforming the educational system. I, I talked about the collective responsibility, education being a collective responsibility. We also need to blur the lines between community and classroom, okay? And really be thinking not only is everybody an educator, but every place is an opportunity for education to occur. And so, uh, when I think about in, engaging um, STEM employers in, in this work and CTE employers in this work, uh, there's a role to be played, certainly on an advisory committee, certainly working in partnership with our institutions to make sure that there's alignment with skills. But I also want to put out there a challenge to, to employers to actually enable and encourage uh, their employees to engage with the community uh, of, of educators more deeply. Um, and and uh, I, I used to work for an organization called Washington STEM, which is really uh, chaired by uh, Dean Allen from <coughs> McKinstry. So thank you, McKinstry, for also uh, supporting the efforts here in Oregon as well. And he put out there, says, look, uh, you know, every spring we've got millions of parents who are going out to support their sons or daughters playing Little League, doing soccer, you know, all of these sorts of things. Why can't we also engage millions of, of our STEM employees in terms of getting out there, creating maker spaces in communities, working with schools to do after school programming, helping, student, helping teachers understand the context for which the content makes sense and matters, bringing those problems of practice that you wrestle with every day. Make it messy. When I think about science, no scientist sits around and talks about the answers. Never. I've been to those parties. <laughs> they're kind of weird, but <laughs> they're talking about what they don't know. Industry's engaged in what they don't know. They're struggling to adapt. They're struggling to solve problems. Bring those messy problems to education, whether it's in school or out of school. Work alongside educators, but build that context where we actually develop the critical thinking, the problem solving, the curiosity, the wonderment, the ability to communicate. Those are the skills that are transferable. So, so do that in multiple ways um, at, at multiple levels, whether it's reaching out to school systems, which you know, are quite honestly embattled in a number of, different, uh, a number of different issues that actually constrain their ability to transform. They're looking for partnerships too, but they want to also decrease the noise. So work alongside them, be understanding about the pressures that exist within the formal education system. They're real. They're not fictitious. And oftentimes, as business and industry, we start throwing snowballs <coughs> at them, going, why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? Well, we can get into the why, but that doesn't 
really matter. It's, it's both of these cultures really need to understand each other and work together to then transform our, our opportunities for our students. Thank you. Dr. Durr? Ditto what he just said. Um, I am a recovering career counselor, and we're skip. <laughs> and the uh, reality of individuals, no matter what the age, of making great choices is experience. Number one, if you want to be a machine tool technologist, what is that? What does that look like? And the reality is that the influencers of individuals making choices is often not based in reality. It's based many times in what a parent or a guardian's perception is of a particular field. So how do we overcome that? We overcome it by having business and industry open their doors and providing opportunities for individuals, um, whether they're 14, 15, 16 years old, or whether they're 25, 26 years old, whether they're a teacher in a classroom you know, who's trying to keep up on what's happening in business and industry. There's nothing more important than that experience, absolutely nothing. And so when I hear from business and industry that one of the things they believe that needs to happen is that youth and others need to have job experience. And they say you need to have more internships. And I say, are you willing to sponsor a student to have an internship? The answer often is no, because it takes too much time. So what takes more time? You know, having to hire individuals, they don't do so hot, they leave, hire another individual, they leave, or actually getting people who truly understand the nature of work. And I hear that so many times, that our youth don't understand work, that our youth are not motivated. That's not true. They're not us. They are not us. So how can we, and I think that's part of what um, my colleagues have been talking about, is then how do we as a community come together, whether it's participating in career fairs, whether it's allowing a student to job shadow, whether it's providing an internship so a student can decide, do they really want to go into business? What does business mean? Maybe they want to be in marketing. Maybe they want to be in accounting. You know, there's so many facets of that. And the reality is maybe that's really not what they want to do, but that's what their dad has told them to do. So that's what I would, you know, state clearly is that this concern that we have about the development of our workforce and having that workforce career ready, work ready, is not just the K-12's responsibility, it's not just the college and university's responsibility, it's everybody's responsibility. And there's so many ways that we can engage our communities to help build that, one, that culture of work and being work ready um, and being college ready. You just talking with a neighbor child about what your experience has been and what school was like because maybe their parents didn't attend school. So I know that sounds kind of sappy, but it really is important. So it takes the community to be able to make this change. Well, thank you. And I think they're pulling out the hook now, so we're just about done. Um, I think just the mere fact that you're willing to come and talk about this with the business audience shows that you're sincere and your desire to all of you and your desire to work with local businesses and having the other superintendents here is great too. So thanks a lot for, for coming today. Um, this is a really uh, important topic, as you can see, and the theme is collaboration. We will take a 20-minute break, and then we'll recommence with our economic development panel and our keynote speaker. So thank you very much. <laughs>